Have you ever looked at the beauty and intricacies of an animal, bird, or fish? And ask yourself, could this really have been created through a process of evolution? Could time plus chance come together and give us all the beauty we see in the world? Hi, I'm David Hames, and in the next few minutes, we're going to take a close look at some animals that are going to shatter that very idea. I want to introduce you to Dr. Job Martin. Dr. Martin has had a very interesting background. He's been a college professor and a dentist. He even served on the dental crew for President Johnson's Air Force One and the Presidential Fleet. But for the past 20 years, Dr. Martin has been lecturing students on incredible creatures that defy evolution. And, uh, and then they asked me to start studying some animals and see if I thought that animal could evolve. Well, the first thing that we really studied together was this little bug called a bombardier beetle. And this little insect, it's about a half inch long, and it mixes chemicals that explode. So I began to think, okay, now how would that evolve? Let's say if evolution is true, and you're evolving along here, and you don't have a defense mechanism, because that is the defense mechanism of the bug. So if evolution is true, it had to somehow evolve that. So let's say it's coming along here. Well, the first time it evolves the, the explosion, what does it do to the bug? Boom, you just splattered your bug, okay? So splattered bug pieces don't evolve. So I thought, well, how, how, how could this have happened? Well, it doesn't blow itself up. It has another little factory inside itself that manufactures chemicals, a chemical, acts as a catalyst, so that when you squirt that chemical in with these other chemicals that are like in neutral, you get your explosion. Well, the first time it manufactured that little chemical, it, it, here it goes again, blew itself up again. But it doesn't, why? Well, because it has like an asbestos-lined firing chamber. And even then it would blow itself up if it didn't have somewhere for the explosion to go. So it has uh, like twin tail tubes. And it can aim these tail tubes all the way up, out the side, out the front. Let's say a spider is coming up toward its side and it doesn't have time to turn around and shoot. Uh, it can just take its little gun turret and aim it out there and shoot. The, the explosion on this little bug, all you hear, if, if you're listening as a human, you hear this pop. But scientists have now put that explosion in slow motion. And it's like, it's like about a thousand sequential little explosions, but all, they're so fast, all we hear is one pop. And so you think, well, now, why would that be? Well, that was a curious thing for the scientists that study this little bug. A lot of them at Cornell University, some other places. And what they discovered was that if it was just one big pop, the, the little bug, if he's shooting like a spider, let's say over here, uh, and he goes room, bang, and shoots it, he's going to pop himself right out of there. It's like lighting a burner on a jet engine. So he's out of there. But as long as it is a sequential explosion with his little legs, he can hang on. How would evolution explain a sequential explosion? This little bug messes with all the theories of evolution. A bull giraffe is about 18 feet tall. In order to get blood up that long skinny neck against gravity, the bull giraffe has to have a powerful pump, and that's his heart. And the heart of a bull giraffe can be as much as two and a half feet long. Big, powerful pump. Now, as he's going along here, living his life, everything's just fine, but all of a sudden, this 18-foot tall creature decides, I need a drink of water. So he bends his head down to get a drink of water. Now we have a problem. Because now this powerful pump, instead of pumping against gravity, is pumping with gravity. And so the heart gives a mighty squeeze, and the blood shoots down his neck, hits his brain, and bursts his brain. And so now he just blew his brains out, okay? So he's dying, and he must be thinking to himself, I need to evolve something here to take care of my problem. When I get a drink of water, I blow my brains out. Of course, we know dead creatures don't evolve, but he doesn't blow his brains out, because as he bends his head down, there are like little spigots in his artery that goes up the neck, little valves, and they close. But the last pump is beyond the last valve, 
And so it's enough to burst the little arterioles in his brain, but it doesn't go into his brain. The last pump kind of goes whoop underneath the brain into like a sponge. And this sponge just gently expands, and he hasn't blown his brains out, and he gets his drink of water. And now he sees a zebra kind of running up from this side, and he just ignores it. But he sees a lion coming up from this side. Oh, the lion wants to eat me. i got to get out of here. Now, how does he know the difference, by the way? Evolutionists can't explain that to us. But the fact is, here comes this lion. He's going to eat the giraffe. And so the giraffe uh, jumps up. He runs about five steps, passes out. Not enough oxygen to his brain. While he's there, passed out. The lion is eating him. Uh, he must be thinking, I, I need to evolve something here. I got this problem. I pass out when I get up too fast. And, but he doesn't, of course. Well, why? Well, because God made him so that when he begins to bring his head up, the little spigots, the little valves in the artery uh, open. The sponge under the brain gently squeezes that last little pump of oxygenated blood up into his brain. There are little valves in the vein that goes down the neck. They close. And by the time he's up and running, Everything is fine, his blood pressure is fine, and he does just fine. Well, how would that evolve? He needs all of those parts, all there, all at the same time, all at once, or he's dead. And so I think the giraffe is another example of a designer. He needed a designer to design him just like he is. The woodpecker is a very special little bird. The beak of a woodpecker is like industrial strength. It is stronger than other birds' beaks. Uh, he has special feet. Most birds have three toes out the front, one toe out the back. Woodpecker has two toes out the front, two toes out the back. And that's so he can climb around on a tree trunk, a vertical tree trunk, right side up, upside down, sideways. He can crawl any way he wants to. He has uh, special tail feathers. His tail feathers are different than other birds' tail feathers. Uh, they're more resilient, they're, they're spongy, and they're very strong and tough because he tripods himself with his two feet and his tail feathers so that he grabs a hold of that tree, fans out his tail feathers, and then bangs his head into the tree. Now you would think that a woodpecker would go home every night and say to Mrs. Woodpecker, oh, I got this headache, I was banging my head on a tree all day. But he doesn't, why? Well, because God made him with special equipment. For instance, between his beak and his skull, there's a piece of cartilage. It acts as a shock absorber. His skull is, is the thickest bone per body weight of any creature. As a matter of fact, brain surgeons study the brains of woodpeckers, how they're hooked in there and everything to help them with like trauma people in accidents that they need to put their brains back in there. And, uh, and so they study woodpeckers. The woodpecker with his strong skull and his shock absorber and his strong beak and his tail feathers and his feet, he's all ready to go except for one thing. Once he drills his hole, he's got to get that bug out of the tree because that's lunch. All right, well, how's he going to do that? Well, most birds, their tongue goes right to the tip of the beak. A woodpecker's tongue goes as much as 10 inches out of his beak. Now, why? Well, because he's going to drill the hole, find the bug tunnel down in the tree, stick his tongue down in the tunnel, and drag the bug out. Now, you would have to say, could I stick my tongue down a hole in a tree and drag a bug out? Of course not. Well, how does the woodpecker do that? Well, God made the woodpecker with little barbs on the tip of his tongue. And he will literally stab that bug larva down in there because it doesn't want to come out. But in case that's not enough, he has a little glue factory in his tongue that manufactures exactly, precisely the right glue to stick to the bug, but it doesn't stick to his beak. And so he pulls that bug into his mouth. Now we have a problem, if evolution is true. Let's say over hundreds of thousands of years, this woodpecker got all this equipment and then he glues his tongue to a bug and he swallows the bug. What just happened to his tongue? He just swallowed his tongue. <laughs> you know, he dies, he just strangled himself, okay? But he doesn't, why? Well, because as he brings the bug into his mouth, he has another little factory that manufactures the solvent to dissolve the glue. So he dissolves the glue, loosens up the bug, swallows the bug. God made him that way. Woodpeckers, when they peck, they open their eyes between each peck and they aim their beak, they focus, they aim their beak, they close their eyes, and then they hit the tree. So you hear a woodpecker out there, he's going drrr, drrr. Every time you hear that drrr, in between each peck, he opens his eyes, focuses, aims his beak, hits the tree. Why? Well, they used to think it was just to keep the wood chips out. But now the scientists have measured the, the force of the impact of the woodpecker's head against the tree. And the force is so great that if he did not close his eyes, he would pop his eyeballs out. So I would say, have you ever seen a blind woodpecker? 
No, they never miss. They never miss. Okay? Now, one special woodpecker, the European green woodpecker. I think he's unique in all the animal kingdom. I don't know for sure, but I think he might be. His tongue is different than any other tongue, as far as I know. Our tongue starts in the back of our throat, comes up and out the front. His tongue starts in the back of his throat, goes down the throat, comes out the back of his neck, up over the top of his head, it's under the skin, comes out a little hole between his eyes, goes in one of his nostrils, and then comes out of his beak. And you'd have to say, now how does that evolve? I've asked evolutionists that question. I've said, now you tell me, how and where did that tongue come from? They, they don't have a clue. They can't tell me. I'm saying, well, you're telling me that this bird evolved from some other creature, but there's no other creature that we know of with a tongue like that. How did that happen? They don't have any idea. So what could I say? I think there are very bright people who study science and do a good job of it. But all of a sudden they get to a point where they have to decide, did this thing happen uh, over long periods of time somehow? Or, boy, it sure looks like it could have happened just bang, just like it is. And then if they discover, hey, I have no way of describing this thing in terms of evolutionary science, they're faced with the other option, which is maybe a designer and a creator, and they say, I don't want to go that way, okay? So they suppress that evidence. And so many of the things that I studied, we had to search just to find information on them because they are not in the textbooks. They just don't put them in because they have no way to explain it. And so they just ignore it. In Mexico, there is a little bee it's a little tiny bee. It's not a whole lot bigger than a flea. It's a true bee. Uh, it doesn't have a stinger, but it is a bee. It's called the Melipona bee or the Melipona bee. And this little bee is closely identified with something that all of us have enjoyed from time to time called vanilla. And I will ask people, do you know where vanilla comes from? And they will say, oh yeah, the vanilla bean. And then we'll say, well, where does the bean come from? Well, it comes from a tree. Well, no, not really. Uh, it comes from an orchid. And the vanilla orchid grows up a tree as a vine. And uh, here is the problem. The vanilla uh, orchid only blooms uh, one morning out of the year. Now, they don't all bloom on the same morning, but it'll bloom two and a half, three hours. And then by afternoon, it wilts, and it can't be pollinated. But why is, why is there a problem here? Well, because the vanilla uh, uh, bean pollen is covered with a, a little septum down inside the flower, so the pollen can't get out. And so God made a little bee called the Melipona bee that knows exactly what to do to pollinate the vanilla flower so that we can get the vanilla bean so that we can have vanilla, which most of us enjoy. And this little bee will come up to the flower and it knows how to land on the flower, push up the septum, find the little entrance there and go in and then when it comes out it has pollen with it and it'll go to the next one and it is it's this little bee was made for the the orchid and without the bee you just don't have the vanilla bean now that came up way back in the day of Hernando Cortez and Cortez when he came over here uh, went to Mexico liked vanilla took some back with him to Europe and then for 300 years, they grew vanilla plants. I, th I guess they did it with cuttings because they didn't get any beans. So like that was like 1519. In, in 1836, a man named Moren decided, I'm going to go to Mexico. I'm going to find out why they get the vanilla bean in Mexico. We don't get the vanilla bean in Europe. So he went to Mexico. He sat down with the vanilla flowers and watched them. And all of a sudden, one day, he hears this and he looks and there's that little Melipina bee and he saw it land, lift up the septum, find the little entry point, goes in and he, oh, I now know why they get vanilla in Mexico and we don't get it. And so here comes artificial pollination. And uh, then they started growing vanilla in the European areas and they could get it because they had to artificially pollinate it because that little bee is the only insect that knows how to pollinate that particular orchid. So the orchid and the bee are made for each other. They had to both be made together at the same time. Otherwise, you, in one generation, you, the vanilla is going extinct because there's nothing there to pollinate it if the little bee isn't there. But if the little bee doesn't have the information to know how to get into the flower, 
which other, other insects apparently don't know how to do that, well then you still get an, in, an extinct flower. So they had to be made together. So I think that shows that, that, the, that our, our creator uh, has made these things in such a way that if we carefully study them, we're face to face with, with a dilemma here. Uh, could this be an accident or could this have been created like it is? And I think he wants us to say, hey, look at this. This was created just like it is. And then he gets the glory and he gets the thanks for doing that. Wow, that's amazing. Who knew? Without the Melipina bee, there would be no vanilla plant and therefore no vanilla. Well, we spent some time talking about incredible creatures that defy evolution, and they really do. Everything we've looked at is, is created and designed. It has purpose, it has function, it has uh, a coordination of so many things that have to all be there. They have to all be there at the same time. When we look at the design that we see in everything that we've looked at, everything in nature, from plant to animal to rock, there is design. Well, that seems to say to me there is a designer. 